So for, uh, you, may, you may be seated, so sorry. Um, so for those of you I haven't met, I am Sutton Lowe. I'm here on staff at church. I'm the new youth director here at the church, uh, and I'm really happy to be here with you all. Uh, so Jesus says, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice. They will know my voice. It's one of my favorite images that Jesus gives us, the image of the good shepherd. And all our readings today are centered on this. There's a theme, if you couldn't tell, between everything going on. And the psalm for today is Psalm 23. So if we would have read all of that, it would have really been hammered home that this is what's going on today. Uh, Jesus is the one who guides us to still waters and green pastures uh, so that we might have that everything that we need. He's our protector in the valley of the shadow of death. He's our comforter, and in his presence, we have all that we need. And there's goodness and mercy there. So Jesus is building on the figural image of the shepherd that goes throughout all of the Old Testament. He's adding more to it. He says, I will lay down my life for the sheep. The hired hand will not do that. The hired hand plays Candy Crush on his phone when the foreman is not there, but that not so with the good shepherd. The good shepherd will die. For the sheep. And ultimately, we know that Jesus dies for our forgiveness. When it becomes a matter of life and death, Jesus stays put. He cares so deeply for the sheep that he would rather lay down his own life than risk the life of his sheep. And so, in this image, Jesus shows us the love of God for us. It is not a distant love, it's not an absent love, it is a love that journeys together through the everydayness of life. That is the love of the good shepherd. So Jesus says, they will listen to my voice. I can almost see this image of Jesus standing at the edge of the pen, calling out to the flock and them recognizing his voice. They become so attuned to the voice of the shepherd that they come running when they hear it. Even if he's so far away that they may not be able to see. So after Jesus was raised from the dead, he walked, he talked, he dined with his followers. Uh, But after 40 days, he ascended into heaven. And we're celebrating that um, very soon. Uh, And I think I often think of the ascension as Jesus leaving. Jesus is gone, that he is absent, that he's far away, that Jesus disappears from us. Uh, But the story of the apostles in Acts shows us that Jesus is not gone. He's not absent and that Jesus is present to us through the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the shepherd to the disciples, and he is still our shepherd today. He's leading us and calling out to us, and we recognize his voice. So our reading from Acts today illustrates Jesus' continued presence. Peter and John were walking into the temple for daily prayer, and there's a man who's crippled and unable to work outside, and he asks for alms. And Peter gives this legendary line where he says, I don't have silver, I don't have gold, but what I do have you, I will give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, be healed. And he grabs his hand, he pulls him up, and his ankles are made strong, and he stands again. And they all go into the temple and they're praising and they're talking about the resurrection of our Lord. And then Peter and John are arrested. Does this story sound familiar to anybody in here? It should. We read it two weeks ago. So, you, you know, you should be paying attention to that. No, I'm just kidding. But it's familiar because it's the same pattern of ministry that Jesus had. If you took Peter and John, James, John's name out of there and you put in Jesus's, it would sound like another passage from Luke. And the people that they are brought before, Annas and Caiaphas, those are the same people that Jesus, after he is arrested, is brought to. They're brought to Caiaphas' house. And it is there that Jesus is condemned by the leaders. And it is also at that house that Peter denies Jesus three times. And so here we are again in a parallel scenario where uh, ministry has been done in the name of Jesus. And they have been arrested and they stand before the leaders of the time. And when faced with the question, by what power and by what name do you do this? Peter is presented with another opportunity to deny Jesus. But this is not the same Peter that we saw quaking in his boots a couple months earlier. Acts tells us Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. The same spirit that hovered over the waters in Genesis 1. The same spirit that spoke through the prophets. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead has filled Peter. He is not the old man that he was. And Peter boldly proclaims, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel 
that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, by Jesus, this man is standing before you. This is not the same Peter that cracked under the weight of his fear. Peter proclaims boldly the gospel truth, the message of forgiveness. And he proclaims it not only to the leaders whose life, whose, his life is in their hands, he proclaims it to all the people of Israel. So even when Jesus is not seen walking and talking and eating with the disciples, the ministry of Jesus is still happening. By Jesus, this is happening. And so the voice of Jesus can be heard through the Holy Spirit that filled Peter. I have other sheep, Jesus says. They're not of this fold. I will bring them also. They will listen to my voice, the voice of the good shepherd. And that voice is the Holy Spirit calling out to us today. The spirit that spoke through the prophets, that hovered over the deep, the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead and filled Peter with boldness, the spirit that cleanses us in our baptisms. That spirit is present to us. And it's by that same voice that Jesus calls out to us today. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is present to us and in us now, here in this room. And I believe that with my whole heart. I do. And I know that it's true. And yet there's this fearful part of me. There's this nagging in the back of my mind that has the question, well, how do you know? How do you know that the Spirit's there? Are you sure? Can you be sure? And I know I'm not the only one who has felt this way. If you look at church history, there's whole streams of the tradition that panic over this question, that seeking assurance, seeking some sort of peace. And I was wrestling with this fear. And I, you know, I was a very fearful child growing up. I was very scared of hell. I was really worried about all that. And even when I went into seminary, into divinity school, I was still wrestling with this question. How do I know that God is there? And I stumbled across a verse in 1 Corinthians. It's 1 Corinthians 12, 3. And just a little context, Paul is talking about false teachers. How do, you know, how do you know if it's a real teacher or a false teacher? And he gives the Corinthians this good little metric. He says, no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one says, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. No one says, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. If you can say that, if you can say Jesus is Lord, the Holy Spirit is present there. And truly, that is the whole gospel in three words. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Lord of your life. He has saved you no matter where you are, no matter what you have done. Jesus is Lord and he's redeemed you. And so Jesus is still our Lord and we are attuned to his voice by the grace of the Holy Spirit. And that's why we can say that he is Lord. And so there is some internal assurance there that you can say that Jesus is the Lord and that the Holy Spirit is there. But what about in the world? Where do we see God in the world? How do we know God is moving? Where is God? Can we hear the voice of Jesus today? The voice of the good shepherd. And I'm here to say, yes, we can. We can hear the voice of the good shepherd. I think of the fruits of the spirit. We see the fruits of the spirit in the world. They permeate every aspect of our lives. Love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We all learn this as a little song at some point. And we know that an orange is not a fruit of the Spirit, but love is. We know these things are the fruit of the Spirit. And so we see Jesus and we hear his voice as the Good Shepherd through these fruits as they permeate all of our lives. So just a very broad example. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and he spoke all things into being. And then he said, it's good. And goodness we know is a fruit of the spirit. And what God speaks happens. And he said, it is good. So we can look at the world and we see the goodness of God. You can look out at a beautiful mountain range or a total solar eclipse in Waco, Texas, and you see that God is good. You see the sublime, you see the beautiful, you see the goodness of the Lord. So in the beauty of creation, the voice speaking goodness echoes out. And it's calling out to us today through that goodness. And so from good creation, we tangibly experience the love of God in our provision. We receive our life from the ground, from the fruit of the ground, from animals that we eat. We literally receive our life. If you don't eat, you're going to die. Every single meal, you're reminded of your dependence on God, your dependence on this good earth. We receive our lives as a gift from the land that God has created and that God has called good. One of my professors told me that every time you eat, you should be hearing God's voice saying, I love you. 
I will provide for you. I delight to give you life. Every single time you eat. And I think that's a beautiful image because I, sometimes I drive through McDonald's or Chick-fil-A or something. I've got to get my food as quickly as I can. I just got to get. But we've got we've to sit in that and remember that God is providing for us. God's showing his love, which also is another fruit of the spirit and the literal fruit of the ground that we eat. And it's delicious. We enjoy it. God provides a beautiful way for us to attune our hearts to him in sharing meals with each other. We can literally taste and see the fruits of the spirit. And we never experience this alone. Even if you are the only one who goes to H-E-B to buy the tortillas and the celery and everything that you need to eat, someone had to grow those things. Someone had to make those things. Our lives are dependent upon each other. No person is an island, as Thomas Merton says. Our lives are bound together. They're enmeshed together. And we see the fruits of the Spirit in our relationships as well. We experience God and we hear his voice in big moments of love and joy like our wedding days or the birth of a child or a big celebration. We experience joy in those moments and we see that love. And we also see faithfulness and fidelity in the humdrum faithfulness of every day, of the little choices we make to preserve our friendships, our marriages, um, our families, Oh, those little acts of faithfulness, God is there in, even when they're boring, even when they're not fun at all and there's nothing joyful seemingly about it. In that humdrum, God is there and his voice is calling out in the faithfulness there. So the voice of God can be heard in joyful occasions, can be heard in everyday fidelity, and it can also be seen and heard in service of others, service of the poor in spirit and the poor. All right now it is go time at the church. You see it in green letters all over. Should have wore a little sticker that says go time on it. Uh, and what we're doing is focusing on our ministries that go outside of the church, our go ministry. Um, and so Jesus tells us that he's with the downtrodden. He's with the oppressed. He's with the least of these is what Jesus says. And he says, you can find me there. You don't know where I am. I'm with the least of these. Whatever you do to them, you do to me. Jesus is clearly identifying with the poor there. And so when we serve them, we see the face of God. And when they talk to us, we hear God's voice. And many of us have experienced that. I've served alongside so many of you. And there is, there's something holy in those moments. And I believe it is the voice calling out to us. But likewise, with the poor, the poor in spirit, those who are grieved, those who are lost, all of us, we've all experienced that. We know those things. And if you haven't, you will soon. That is just the nature of life. And it's hard. But many of us know the love and the kindness of someone knocking on the door and bringing another lasagna to fill your fridge up after you've lost someone you love. We know what it's like. We've seen those moments. And there's something holy about sitting with someone in grief, about just being present, even if you don't have the right words to say, even if there's no words to say. Being present to that person, that faithfulness, that love, is the voice of God. You feel that. You see it. There's holiness there. There's indescribable love in sitting with the grieved and comforting those who mourn. So in the depths of our human life, the voice of God is still heard today through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I might add, especially in those steps, God is there. Especially in those depths, God is present to our human lives and calling out to us with the voice of the Good Shepherd through the Holy Spirit. He's calling us into his love. He's calling us into himself. And right now, he's about to call us to his table. He's about to call us to the altar and say, taste and see my love for you. And so we'll hear his voice in that moment. So Easter is not the end of Jesus's ministry. It's the beginning of something new. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is working in us now, bearing fruit in our lives and in our world and proclaiming the words of salvation. Jesus is Lord. Amen.